So first, engagement. So like one important thing to note about BP debating is it's fairly weird in the sense that there's a lot of people making separate speeches. Um, like that's not how we communicate in real life. Like you don't talk for five minutes straight and then the next person talks for five minutes straight. So in that sense it's really artificial and strange. And like to try and stop it being too artificial and strange and to have some kind of actual dialogue on the floor, it's important that two things happen. The first one is rebuttal, so actually talking about other people's points because if I talk about something, then James talks about something completely different. Then as a judge at the end of the session I've got to go, so John talked about something, James talked about something completely different. How do I work out which was better? Like that's why it's really important to firstly do rebuttal and explain why what James talked about was really not very good. And secondly to do POI so James has a chance to actually communicate with me in a way that isn't simply making speeches at different times. So you actually get a level of communication. Um, so first off, we'll talk about rebuttal. So most of you, I think, have done an argumentation session, right? Or some kind of session on analysis in some respect. So you know about the different ways we structure your substantive points. Now, what, which would be, you first do your statement of what the point is, you then offer some kind of explanation, you then offer some kind of example, and then you, you then offer a conclusion. So what parts of that structure argument do you think it's really important to attack when you're rebutting the argument? Or what points do you think are less important to attack? Explanations to be Yeah. Hmm. So like, when someone's given you an explanation as to why something's important, when you're rebutting it, you should give an explanation as to why it's not important, or you should give an explanation as to why it doesn't actually work in the way that they're saying it works. Um, but what is something that you really don't want to be engaging in, or you don't want to be attacking, or is kind of a waste of time if you're attacking? Mm -hmm. Examples. So, although you might quickly refute an example, it is a waste of time for you to spend a long, long time explaining why their example is wrong. Because the point of the argument isn't the example. It may not even be the impacts. It's the kind of the general principle of the argument that you want to try and get at and attack. Like, so it's important that you don't spend time, like too much time saying, well, that particular example was wrong and therefore their point's wrong. Like it's very easy to dispute an example, but normally the example is just where illustrating the point, it isn't what the point itself is based on. So you may be you maybe affect how much I believe the point, but you don't tell me why the point's wrong or why the point leads to bad um, aspects. So like also, what do you want to do when you've heard a speech? How do you decide what's the good points to rebut? The, the more uh, the more debatable points, like the, the, there are some uh, uh, there are some quotes or, or, or one line which you, you can't really, really turn at someone, but there yeah. are fakeish things that you can attack. Yeah, so the first criteria you want to do is look at which points were actually, um, look at what you think their actual points were. So if they didn't give any explanation to a claim that they made, if there's no analysis at all, if it's just a throwaway line, don't spend your time rebutting it. Like, the judges aren't going to give it any credit anyway, like, don't, don't waste your time on it. Then what you want to think about when you've worked out what their actual points are is what the most convincing point is and how you go about taking it down. Um, so like, once you've found out which points you want to rebut, how do you go about actually rebutting the points? Like, what are some tactics you can do for taking down an argument? <coughs> uh, repeating the arguments and seeing where you're wrong and seeing where you're right. Yeah. So like, one way of doing it is showing that the argument isn't true or doesn't seem to make sense. So while they've given you analysis as to why, I mean, let, let's go through some arguments, James. Think of a debate. Oh, no, okay. The death penalty? Did you have a death penalty for? Yeah, but... <coughs> Are you guys doing the death penalty today? <coughs> yeah. No, not the death penalty. Okay. Um, so like, when you have the death penalty debate, the prop side, presumably, they're going to stand up and say, the reason the death penalty 
is a good idea is because it's a deterrent. Like it's going to make people call, like commit less crimes. So how do you take that argument? Like assuming there's been some level of good analysis to it. Because I can see there are multiple ways you can attack that argument, right? The death penalty is a deterrent. Can someone tell me one way you might take it? Yeah. You are also killing people by acting out the death penalty. Precisely. So you say that even if it is a deterrent, bad things happen as a result of it, right? So like, it may be a deterrent, but even <coughs> if it is, the way it's being a deterrent is killing people, which is a bad way of being a deterrent. So that's one way of attacking the idea that the death penalty is a deterrent. You say, it may be a deterrent, but it kills people, fairly intuitively so. Um, what's another way you can attack the argument? If they claim it is a deterrent, you could claim... Why? It's not it's a deterrent. Not. It's not a deterrent. <laughs> yes. So, straight off, first of all. So, you might say, it's not a deterrent, and like think about the way people think when they're committing crime. So like, there's a lot of research that says the death penalty doesn't act as a very effective deterrent. And you can talk about the type of crimes people do like get the death penalty for, and like if you're going to murder someone and the choice is between life in prison or dying, it doesn't necessarily mean that up the margins less crime is going to occur. So, what you can do is you can say why it isn't the case or why their mechanism for how it's going to be a deterrent doesn't hold. You can also say the bad side effects that happens. So when you're doing rebuttals, one really good thing to remember is you don't, you don't just have to rebut something in one way. So you can structure rebuttals whereby you say, firstly, we don't think it is a deterrent. This is why it isn't a deterrent. Talk about the way people think about crime. And then you go, my second point of rebuttal to this point is the idea that even if I'm wrong, even if it is a deterrent, the side effects are really, really bad. And like, one of the important things you need to do in rebuttal is like some kind of comparative aspect where you say like, even their, their benefits are on the comparison less good than the status quo in the sense that like, the harms that we bring you are worse than the harms that are prevented. So even if we get one less murder, we think on the comparison it's better that like, like it's better that we don't execute a load of people meaninglessly in order to prevent maybe one or two crimes on the margins. So in that sense you can contain points and say why they're not as important as they've been saying, while at the same time saying that it doesn't actually work in the way they're saying. So there are two ways you can do it. Um, right, yeah, there's, there's also just a broader way that you can kind of attack this point. So if someone says, okay, the death penalty deters crime, you can say, okay, <coughs> yes, it deters crime, and you sort of start on this, but it still kills people. Right? You say, okay, let's look at what else deters crime. So what else could we do that deters crime? Well, we could like lock everyone up in their own individual cell, and that would stop all crime forever. But we would, I think we'd all agree that that would be a pretty horrific thing to do. Everyone would have a miserable existence <laughs> in a prison. Um, and there'd be no crime, but everyone would be really, really unhappy. It would be a terrible society to live in. So you can start there, establish a basis where you say, okay, so there are some things that we as a society aren't willing to do to deter crime and proposition kind of, oh sorry, opposition will kind of have to accept this. Yeah, yeah proposition will have to accept this. So they have to accept that there's, there, there are things that they won't do to deter crime. So now you say, okay, there are things we won't do to deter crime. How do we work out what it is that we won't do? Where's that line that we draw? And then you start to build in, you weave in this rebuttal, you can weave this rebuttal in, you can, to, you can build it up into your own point in fact. Is that to say, okay, um, let's say that the line is you probably just shouldn't kill people in order to stop other people dying. That seems like, at best, you're probably just, even if that works as a, uh, a kind of deterrent, we're probably just exchanging one life for another. Maybe it's the life of a criminal for the life of an innocent, but we, on opposition, say you can't 
measure life that way. I think it's a really bad way of trying to like weigh up goods and bads. And that's why, even if it is a deterrent, it's a really horrible deterrent that we don't want to use. Yeah. So like, also, what I'd say is like there are some practical things to think about in terms of rebuttal. So first of all, label your rebuttal. So like, when you're making a speech, say, I've got four points of rebuttal, I've got five points of rebuttal, and then tell me when you move between them. And don't be afraid to rebut the same argument in different ways. Because then if one rebuttal isn't convincing, then you've still got the other one to fall back on, and that makes it more convincing. And it's just, as a judge, it's so much easier to follow if you go, first point of rebuttal, why the death penalty doesn't actually disincentivize crime, da 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 da. Second point of rebuttal, even if the death penalty does disincentivize crime, there are harms which are comparatively worse when you bring in the death penalty. Third point of rebuttal, and then on to maybe their next substantive point, and give me a couple of reasons why that was the case. Secondly, as a practical thing of like coming up with rebuttal, try in preparation time to anticipate what's going to happen. So like, in the sense that you can, when you're preparing for your side of the case, you should also be thinking about what's most likely that the other side are going to say. Because like, when they, when first, if you're first opposition, you shouldn't suddenly be really shocked that proposition team have got up and have started talking about deterrence in terms of the death penalty. Like, that should have been something you prepared for. You should have rebuttals ready to deal with it when that occurs. Like, so in prep time, at least in the last couple of minutes, have a brief discussion between your partners and say, what are they likely to say? How do we deal with it? Let's think of some good rebuttals um, before we've even had a chance to hear them say. And obviously, you're not going to be able to think of everything, and it's good that you react within the speech. But just being aware and having some kind of preparation for it is really useful. Um, also, like in terms of rebuttal, when you make your main substantive points, like point out why those substantive points are comparative. So, yeah, in then, like I've, I've, I've drawn up process for this point. Okay, so as a judge, what you typically do is you have your piece of A4 paper, and there are some ways that people want to do it, some big ways that people do it, one way, some big ways that people do it. Like I draw my paper like this. So I have. First proposition speech, my notes got the top left hand corner. First opposition speech, they got the top right hand corner. Okay. Second speech, second speech. So I, at the end of the debate, when everyone goes out of the room, I have my piece of paper, I have two pieces of paper, one for the top half, one for the bottom half, that look a bit like this. And I'll have, um, if you've structured your points and you've said during your speech, my first point is this, blah, 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 blah. My second point is this, blah, 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 blah. My third point is this, blah, 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 blah. My notes, should look like that. It's really nice when I look back at when I when the debate's <laughs> over and I looked out at my piece of paper. If my notes look like that, I'm quite happy because it means that we had a debate which was well structured, which is quite clear, and I know what the points in your speech were. Now, when we talk about engagement, why clash is important, why it's important to telegraph clash, what I mean by that is, for example, when you say I'm going to do some rebuttal, say I want to rebut this point for my opponent's speech, because when you do that, I write down the piece of rebuttal, I can just draw a little line here that says, okay, they rebutted point one from that speech. And that lets me go that go back when I'm in yeah, when I'm judging, I can look I can look at that little line of rebuttal, and I know why did they say that? And I've got my little line drawn across a piece of paper. Oh right, they were attacking that point. They're explaining why that point is bad. And if I think that rebuttal is successful, then I can go, okay, so that point's done. This team did quite well. That's how you get points for engagement. Similarly, if you if you find yourself, like say you're in your third point, and it's just a point that it's one of your substantive points, and halfway through the point, you realise that you're kind of accidentally rebutting, say, the second point from the other side. Of speech. Like not not or even accidentally. Not even accidentally. Because but like if you, you're say you're in a in a debate where like one side's all about freedom of speech and you're about you know, the role of the government in protecting citizens. Like, one of your substantive points should be why it's the government's right to protect or duty to protect citizens. Like, when you talk about that, inherently you're going to be clashing with the idea of freedom of speech because you're talking about how we sometimes limit it. So when you're making your point about why the government has a duty to protect people, it's really useful if you go, Oh, and obviously this clashes with what they were saying about freedom of speech, because while they've said it's something that we should just always grant, 
we've given you more nuanced reasons as to why sometimes we don't grant a complete universal freedom of speech. And then all my judges' paper, a little line gets drawn. Ah, they're rebutting that in that main point. Okay, so I, I can start to draw a clash. When you start to draw a clash, you gain a better picture of what happened in the debate. It stops being this set of five or seven minute speeches that just happened one after the other. You can start to see the arguments as sort of the points and the counterpoints and the rebuttals and how they sort of interconnect to form flowing argument. And once, as a judge, you can see that flowing argument, it's a lot easier to work out who won. So what you really should be trying to do as teams is always, always, always sort of just telegraph when you're clashing with another side, when you're knocking down a point that's been made on the other side, and literally do state, oh, by the way, this explains why their point on this is wrong or bad, it doesn't work, it doesn't make sense. Because that is, that is you explicitly speaking to me as the judge, saying you need to draw a little line on your notes so that you can remember later on in the deliberation period that I made this point of rebuttal, that I clashed here. And then when I'm thinking about which team clashed the most, which team brought the most to the debate, um, which team contributed the most material that was relevant, I have all of these lines and the team with the most lines tends to win. Yeah, so whenever you hear, and like just as a recap of everything you said in this like the start of the session, whenever you hear someone making a point on the other side of the bench to you, you should always have a checklist in your mind where you think of certain questions. The first question should be, is the point they're making relevant? You go, yes or no, is it relevant? If it's not relevant, you think, I don't need to spend too much time rebutting it. I can just at the start of the speech say, look, the point they made there was completely irrelevant. Second question you ask yourself, does what they're saying actually work? Does the causal mechanisms of what they've said here lead to the kind of claims they're making? So the deterrent example, is this actually a deterrent? You explain why it's not a deterrent, you, you take down the causal mechanism. If you think the causal mechanism does properly work, then ask yourself the question, does this lead to harms that they haven't spoken about? If it does lead to harms, then explain what those harms are. If you explain what those harms are, then ask the question, why, is, why are these harms comparatively like, worse than the benefits that they're trying to bring on their side of the house? And then finally, once you've thought of all those questions and answered them, when you're rebutting a point, you finally think, how can I label this so the judges know what I'm talking about? And if you answer all of those questions, then you'll probably do quite an effective rebuttal. And you'll also probably avoid doing rebuttals, long rebuttals, to things that you shouldn't, you don't need to rebut, because you can't ask all those questions for an example, because you'll realise that that isn't the point, it's just an example. Um, and, can I just put, no, okay, so rebuttal, this is really important, this is why we call this um, workshop engagement, not just POIs. Rebuttal doesn't just flow one way. This is why it's important to kind of just write down notes on what your opponents are talking about. Try and have, it doesn't have to be as detailed as a judge's notes, but keep track of what they were saying. Keep track especially of when they started saying that they're rebutting specific points on your side. Because when you see your opponents rebutting one of your points, you then have to make a decision as a team well, the next speaker has to make a decision. Okay, do we let that rebuttal stand? Or do we try and counter it? Do we try and keep that point alive? And of course, if they've rebutted a really important point on your side, then it's quite likely you're going to want to bring it back. Um, so you'll need, um, this is where teamwork comes in. Say, okay, so your first speaker has made points one, two, and three, and first speaker in opposition um, rebuts point, says they've rebutted point one and rebuts point two. Um, you now, this person now has a decision to make because they've got the speech planned. But because of what's happened in the speech before them, they now have to decide how they're going to deal with these problems. Because as a team, they need to make sure that they've got the much, much material standing at the end. So maybe point one got rebutted, or maybe there was an attempt at rebuttal that you think actually it's probably not. It's probably still alive, that rebuttal wasn't very good, we can just live with that. And you could just say that. Yes, uh, we made this point. They tried to rebut it, they failed. We think that point's still alive. It's a valid thing to do if you, know, you happen to be right. But otherwise, um, 
say a point has been rebutted, you need to do pretty much the same thing to the rebuttal as the rebuttal did to the original point. So you can marginalize it. You can say, okay, this, this, this rebuttal kind of applies, it explains why, you know, why the point is wrong <coughs> in certain circumstances, but is right the rest of it. What they didn't say is that it's right the rest of the time, this debate's about what's right the rest of the time. Therefore, even though you tried to rebut it, it failed. Or you need to explain why the rebuttal was simply logically wrong, bad, doesn't make sense, like all the kinds of things that you explain why some scientific points don't, are wrong, bad, and don't make sense. So, any questions on the rebuttal side? Okay, well, I think what we'll do now is move on quickly to points of information. And what we'll do is, I'll go through points of information, and then I do genuinely think probably the most useful thing will be to at least have a top half debate, so we'll just have four people in the debate, and then we'll all kind of get together as judges and show you how it would be judged, talk about how the engagement has actually worked in that kind of scenario. Because I think that is actually the best way to learn. Um, and it will give you something to do as you've been sitting listening to people for a fairly long time today. So, points of information. Why are they important? They're important because it's a mutual conversation. They're also important because it's a way of taking down other teams' cases. Because, like, after you're, if you say you're Prime Minister, like, otherwise you're just sat there for a long time not being able to do anything or not being able to say anything. If nothing else will keep you entertained for a while and actually keep you feeling and looking in the eyes of the judges involved in the debate, which is really important. Like, it's also good to use as a defensive weapon in terms of showing why your material is still important in the debate and making people talk about your material and making you seem important. So, practical things. Um, firstly, like, we cover this in the general session, but only offer POIs within the middle three minutes of unprotected time. <coughs> Other practical things, please do stand up when you offer a POI. Um, please only say, sir, madam, point of information, or just nothing. Like, just standing up on its own is fine. Like, it's really irritating if someone makes their point of information as they're standing up, because, like, that's just rude. Um, and, like, it just... Yeah. But do you have to make your point of information to the judges? Like, do you have to ask the question to the judge? No. You, you, ask, you ask a question to the speaker because the speaker ultimately chooses to either say no thank you or simply just wave the person down or to accept you. You can also, if you're like halfway through a point and you want to take the person but you don't want to do it till after your point's finished, you can say stay standing, finish your point, and then once you finish your point, say okay, go. Like, that's completely fine. Um, don't leave people standing for like three or four minutes, because it's really irritating. Like, some teams do that tactically because they don't want people to take notes, but that's just like a nasty thing to do and will not reflect well on you as a team, and judges will probably notice it. Another practical thing is you don't get a right to reply with points of information. Like, I know some debate formats, like, if someone answers your question you don't feel they've answered it properly, you can say right to reply and then have a conversation. Like, that can't ever happen in BP debating. You can wait a bit and get up again and ask another point of information if you don't feel you've been answered adequately, but there is no right to reply, so never stand up and have a dialogue between two people. Um, general tips are how to do good POIs. Firstly, keep them really short. A POI should not be a list of three questions. It should be the best question you can possibly think of. Like, this just makes sense in your own self-interest. Because if you ask for really long, rambling points of information, then you give someone a really long time to think about what their answer is going to be. If you give someone a really short point of information, it takes them by surprise. They look bad because their thinking time isn't when you're talking. Their thinking time is when they're stood there looking like a lemon, just thinking. It's so, like, how am I going to answer that? It's like, that's really, really important. Also, it's just irritating if someone stands up and makes a POI which is like 30 seconds long. It's a wasting the time of the speaker. If someone offers you a really long rounding point of information, just tell them to sit down the moment you've got the gist of it. Like, points of information as a rule should probably not be any more than 15 seconds long, if that. Like, that's perfectly enough time to make a good point of information. Um, Rehearse the points you're going to say before you say them, even in your head. Like, write down what you think your point of information is going to be. Like, think about it. Like, 
make sure that there isn't a really obvious response. Like if they can just say yes or no and it doesn't damage their case, then it's probably not a good point of information and like just doesn't do anything in terms of taking down their case. It's like actually think about what you're going to say so you don't stand up and then fluff your lines and end up not really saying anything in the point of information. Like make sure that you stand up and say the point of information you want to say. And like the best way to do that is just plan it and say it a couple of times in your head and maybe have it written down. Um, also like work as a team to think of your points of information. It's perfectly good and a lot of good teams will have a bit of paper between them. They'll write down the points of information. They'll write down what they think the best point of information is. And then like as a team you can be whispering and cross out what you think a bad POI is. Like don't get into a massive fight over it, but like try and together come up with what you think is the best tactical point of information to offer at that point. Because there's no point like if one of you has a really amazing point of information and the other one stands up and offers a really bad, irrelevant one, like firstly it creates a bit of tension and resentment, which is never good because it's a team sport. But secondly, it just doesn't help your case in the way that you otherwise could. Like, be active, stand up and offer a lot of points of information, make sure you're both offering points of information, otherwise one person will look a lot weaker or stronger. And like it's good to <coughs> be a good team and work with a team. Um, when should you offer points of information? Um, offer them, like you're free to offer them any time in the protected time, but you're more likely to be accepted if you offer them between points. It's like when someone's moving between two substantive points and you offer a POI, they're far more likely to take you. Similarly, if they're moving between rebuttal or a point of information, they're probably more likely to take you because it's a natural pause. Also, a lot of things that people do quite effectively is if anyone says something really controversial, then they'll all stand up and go, point of information, like to express, and like just as a bit of theatrics to kind of like show that something strange or contentious <coughs> has been said. If you do that, and it's fine to do that, then make sure you actually have something to say. Because there's nothing more embarrassing than standing up in outrage and going, point of information, and going, yeah? And you then get flustered because you've just stood up to make a dramatic point rather than because you have a question. Like, that's another good reason to have POIs written down. It means that you can do the dramatic theatrical stuff and actually still offer a good point of information. Um, so, like, what can you actually aim to achieve with point of information? Um, uh, if uh, someone says something in the first minute and you still want to make point of information about it, can you ask it after? Yeah. Um, so, like, you don't have to ask the point of information specifically about what they're talking about at that specific moment. If they say something really <laughs> bad or controversial in the first minute and you don't get accepted for a point of information until the fourth minute, actually, you can't be accepted in the fourth minute, until the third minute, like three and a half minutes, then Make sure you like still question or still ask the best point of information possible. You don't need to ask about what they're talking about at that present point in time. If they've moved on, it's fine. You want to ask the best point of information, not the one that makes logical sense, or not the one that is what they're talking about specifically at that moment in time. <coughs> so like there are lots of things you can achieve with good points of information. Like you can make speakers look like they don't know what they're talking about, which is nice, and like a fairly flippant thing. More importantly, you can make speakers talk about your material. You can make yourselves look important in the debate through doing that. You can engage with teams that you didn't otherwise have a chance to engage with. You can identify inconsistencies in cases, in teams' cases. You can make them concede things to you. And yeah, you can just make them generally look a bit confused. So like the first thing or one tactical thing that people do quite effectively in points of information is like identifying things that are inconsistent in an argument. So, or making people's principles seem stupid by giving an analogous situation. Um, so for example, um, you can ask the point of information, if you support this, would you support this? And like, I mean a good example of this is, maybe not, Good example. An example of this is I was in a debate about um, whether we should protect future people. So like whether there should be a constitutional court that defends the rights of future people. And the upsides were talking a lot about we shouldn't protect future people because 
like the reason we protect people is because they have an impact on government, because they vote, because there's some kind of democratic process. It's like one of the POIs the prop team offer is if if you think that the reason we protect people's rights is because they have a vote, do you think the government has any responsibility to protect children? And like you see how that works. Like you're standing by that principle and you're saying, if we accept the principle you're advocating, then do you accept these bad circumstances that happen as a result of that? So then they've got two choices ahead of them, both of which are really not very good for them. They can either say, no, I don't think we have any right to protect children, which makes them seem crazy and probably not very nice people, or they can say, you're right, there are some circumstances where our principle doesn't hold. And like this takes down a lot of the effectiveness of that argument. Because if they can say, we stand by this principle, and then they have to say, oh, but in certain circumstances, we don't, then it obviously takes away the power of that argument. So there's lots of ways you can phrase those kind of POIs. You can say, would you support this? And then give a situation that's analogous. You can also ask, why do you think we do this? So you could say, why do you think we protect children even though they don't vote? And that's quite good tactically because then you force them to basically make an argument for your side of the house. Because when they're explaining why they don't, they're also explaining why there are circumstances where their principle doesn't hold. Um, another kind of good... Oh, also when you make those kind of speeches, um, POIs, it's a really good idea to follow them up in a future speech. So when you say, would you support this, and it's an analogous situation, if you've got a speech after that POI, you can say, why did I offer that point of information? I offered it because this is consistent and this is the same as what they're doing. And like, look at the results. So like, following up the points of information is a really, really good thing to do in speeches. Um, another thing you can do is kind of a leading question or a question that kind of identifies a lack of knowledge about a certain topic or a question which makes them be more specific than they were being and makes their case harder to defend. So in any speech about, um, about like things that are consensual, a good point of information to offer early on is how do you actually go about establishing consent? And then they have to give you some kind of reason, some kind of mechanism, and you can attack that so you're giving yourself more material to actually attack. Or like a question that kind of reveals that they're not fully aware, aware of like the information that is important in this debate. Um, so for example, in a debate about um, in a debate about whether um, we should give Georgia membership of NATO um, because of South Ossetia and what's the other one? As I don't know. Um, 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 <laughs> Yeah, so because of the South Ossetia problem and the fact that Russia invaded it, you can offer a point of information saying, are you aware of who negotiated the last peace settlement between Russia and Georgia? To which the answer is France. And if they reveal they don't know that, then you can then, in your speech, come up and say, why is it really important that France were the negotiating party and the fact that France are a member of NATO? It's important because when Georgia become a member of NATO, then it's no longer, you no longer have a party which aren't biased, that are able to be part of that kind of negotiation, because they suddenly have to be in line with Georgia. So like, identifying gaps in people's knowledge which you then can use is also another kind of thing that you can do with points of information. Yeah. How commonly is the technique used to you know, refer to points of information that you have asked? Like, do you do that often? Like, the, I offered that POI because of reason. Yeah, I mean, you don't always do it. It's like, you judge when it's actually going to be useful in your case and do it. It often happens in rebuttal. So when you're talking about general things they've said, you can say, like, and let's look at the information that I offered, and let's look at how badly it was responded to, and why it was responded to that badly, and why it's very important. Also, if one of your points of information goes alongside one of your substantive points, then you can also refer to it when you're doing your analysis of that substantive point. You'll know when you're giving the POI. So basically, there are, there are two kinds. There is either the kind of POI where 
the person responding has to give an answer which obviously damages their case. Um, like the example we had earlier. Um, so like no answer they can give. For example, yeah, on, on children. Yeah, do we have responsibilities of children? There's no answer um, you can give that looks bad. It's obvious it damages the case immediately. Yeah. The other kind of POI is the one where you're setting up a trap. So if you ask, do you know who negotiated the peace between Russia and uh, Georgia, um, that dream war? Like, if they say no... You need um, to explain yeah, why... The, 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 judge, the judge can just be sitting there going, well, they don't know. I don't know either. Why do I care? So, <laughs> if you're so you care. have to come back to that and then explain in your speech. That's why you would come back to it and say, look, earlier I asked them if they knew this. They didn't know this. Here's why it's actually important. When you explain why it's important, then you draw back to what they, they said, and the judge realizes, oh, okay, not only did they not know the answer to that question, actually the answer to that question is very important. Yeah. So they don't know. Um, because they didn't know, their case is actually quite flawed. They look bad, you look good. Like that only works if there is a crucial, a crucial point that needs to be known in order to make like an important point in the debate. And can't just ask a crazy, difficult to know question and say, like, are you aware of what Vladimir Putin's grandson is called? I don't think he has a grandson, but like, are you aware of what his second cousin's name is? And then they go, no, and then you, well, it's really important that you didn't know he was called Jeffrey because, like, there's, there's no reason. Like, it, it gives you no benefit to say. That. But if there is something that, like, is an important part of knowledge, which really has helped you in your case and you don't think they know it, then like pointing out the fact they don't know it and then giving the answer and explaining why the answer is really important can be a really good way of setting a trap and like making yourself seem like a very accomplished team that not only have all the knowledge but also make good arguments as well. When you realise that you've been trapped, it's, that's one of the instances where it is really, really important back on someone's of your side speech to actually engage with that trap and explain why it isn't a trap or not so much of a trap. In this instance, when they say, ah ha ha, but France is no longer going to be a neutral mediator, you can say, okay, yes, it's no longer going to be a neutral negotiator, but that doesn't matter because Georgia's now in NATO and doesn't yeah. need a neutral arbitrator because it's got NATO and that's much better. Um, so it is um, like that, that trap can be negated and you can turn the negation into a point that says, ah yeah, this trap was a stupid trap. Yeah. But if you don't do that, then the impression the judge is left with is you got trapped, they win. Yeah. Final like type of POI that I'd suggest people do is POIs that just shamelessly flag your own material and why your own material is important. Like this is something that's very much a first half tactic. So if you're in opening government and like you kind of feel like the other teams really stopped talking about your material, they've started ignoring it, but you still feel it was fairly important and you want the judges to remember that you were in the debate. <coughs> One of the things you can do is offer the POI that's like, will you be the first person to engage with what my partner brought you about this? Will you be the first person to tell me why whatever we've said isn't important or why this isn't the case? <coughs> Or more subtly, just POIs which clearly relate to stuff that you've spoken about. Just like making people talk about your material makes you seem important in the debate, especially if they fail to respond to it effectively. Because then the judges will be like, oh, so their stuff remains standing, even though they spoke about it, they weren't able to take it down, which is the ideal situation. Um, any questions on giving POIs? Cool. So finally, on us talking at you, um, taking points of information, and general things about how to actually respond to them effectively. Um, firstly, who do you think you should actually take from a point of information? You've got two teams standing up, you're speaking. You're in, I don't know, you're in second proposition. Who do you accept for a point of information? First, propos first proposition? Anyone else think different? The correct answer is there is no answer. It's a trick question because there is no hard and fast rule about who you should take for a point of information. Some people think you should take the strongest team, some people think you should take the weakest team to make yourselves look good. 
Like, there isn't a correct answer. There are different circumstances where you should do different things. Like, I do agree, and it is an important point, that somebody in the second half, if you're in the second half, it's a good idea for somebody to take a point of information from the first half because they don't, haven't had a chance to rebut you and it makes you seem like a stronger team. However, if the first half were really, really crazy and completely out of the debate and you're trying to beat the team in front of you, it makes perfect sense to take points of information from the team in front of you to have more engagement with that team. Like, I definitely wouldn't advise you to just take people you think are going to offer bad points of information. Like, it's better if, because like the judges will probably be going, oh, he just whipped out of it, he or she just didn't want a hard point of information. Like, if someone looks really strong around, don't be afraid to take that point of information and answer it well. Like, that's, that's a better way of going about things. Obviously, if you feel like your case is really not very good and you don't want to be, and it seems like they've got a really good point of information, there will be some circumstances where tactically you want to avoid having your case torn apart. So there is no real hard and fast rule about who you should definitely accept in terms of first half or second half, or who you should definitely accept in terms of um, like weak or strong teams. Also when you're accepting points of information, don't let people answer, ask two points of information. Like, if they've asked one, just sit them down and answer that question. When they start going, and another thing, go, no, and just answer the first one. Or if they ask you two things, like you have no reason to answer both of them, just answer the easy one, or the one that makes you look the best. Like, if they've made the mistake of offering two points of information when they're only allowed to, like, as one speak, as one question, then they don't get the right for you to answer both. Like, that's not how POIs work. They can sit down and stand up and ask another one if they want another point of information. Um, accept points of information not at your weakest point. So if you're struggling, a point of information isn't going to help you. The point of a point of information is to kind of take down your case. So if you're going, oh no, I can't think of anything, I'm a bit lost. The solution to all your problems is not going to be giving the opposite team a chance to criticise you. Like, that isn't going to help. Try and accept points of information at your strongest point. So when you're moving between two substantive points, go, before I go on, I'll take a point of information from you. Um, if you completely run out of material before five minutes is up, which does happen to all of us sometimes, like, the solution isn't taking three or four points of information in a row. Like, it's better to take one or two and then say, Mr. Speaker, that's why I propose, and sit down at four minutes rather than five, then talk for one minute and then accept six points of information because you've just given them another speech. And, like, that just benefits them and hurts you. Like, don't use points of information as a way of getting out of trouble. It's better to just end strongly and decisively early than to speak really, really badly or let them speak really well during your speech. Um, responding to points of information. So, if you get a really good point of information and you need to concede a harm, you need to say, yes, they're right, there is that kind of harm on our side of the house, then what you really, really need to do is explain why it isn't such a big harm as they might think. So why the harm might in some way be mitigated. And also explain why on the comparative, even if it is a bad harm, the benefits on your side of the house outweigh that harm. So everything should always be comparative. If, if they get you and you go, fair cop, you know, that is pretty bad. However, this is worse. Like, that's a good way of getting out of really, really bad or like really, really destructive points of information. Um, if you get presented with one of those things where it's like, where they present something that seems analogous to your case and say, do you support this then? Try and work out why you wouldn't support that. So often there'll be other reasons that aren't to do with your principle. So you go, well, the, although the principle may be the same, there are certain, there are certain characteristics of this case which seems analogous, which are actually different, which means I don't need to support this. There may be overriding harms, which means I don't need to support this. Finally, on responding to points of information. When you've finished responding to the points of information, 
Don't let that destroy the structure of your speech. It happens to a lot of people where they answer a point of information and then they kind of, it ruins the rest of their speech because then it's something that they haven't planned for perfectly and the structure goes. Like, take a breath, say, now I'm going to get back talking about this, my second substantive point, and go back into your structure. You shouldn't really be accepting points of information in the middle of a substantive point, but sometimes you'll have to due to time constraints. And when you do it, make sure you reintroduce what you're talking about and go, I'm now going to continue speaking about my second substantive point. I'm now going to continue on this. Like, that really, really helps in terms of like not completely losing structure. Anything to add? Yeah, well, no. yes. um, yeah actually, okay, so, as a beginner, it's really, really easy to get flustered when people are offering you POIs um, and to let people roll over you. I would say, it, always remember, when you're speaking up, when you're standing up, when you're speaking, it's your time, the room belongs to you, you are in complete charge of who you allow to offer you a POI and who you don't allow to offer you a POI. Remember that you are in charge and don't let the people offering you POIs take control of your time. If they're talking for too long, cut them off and tell them to sit down. There are people, there are people that use POIs in a fairly nasty, aggressive way, in the sense that they will stand up again and again, fairly aggressively, and go, Mr. Speaker, and I look completely outraged as though you're saying the most terrible things in the world. You're not. It's just a play act by them. And like, it's like, don't do the same thing. It's like, it's not a very nice way of going about debating. It's nice if debating is fun and inclusive. Like occasionally if someone says something contentious, it's all very well to stand up and be like, Ugh. but like, don't, don't every five <coughs> seconds be standing up looking really disgusted and like using your ability to stand up quickly as a way of intimidating other speakers. Like when people do that, it's just like, if they, it's just because they don't feel they can actually beat you of their case and they have to resort to tactics like that. It's far better if you beat people with words rather than play acting. Um, also, as a general thing, I think most of you receive stopwatches in your lovely yellow bags. They are very useful. Make sure you use your stopwatches when speaking because then you're more in control in terms of timings. You can see where you are in the speech and you can choose about what time you want to accept a point of information. So like, in terms of just general as a non-responsive point, like then you can make sure you haven't spent four minutes just rebutting and not said any substantive points. In terms of points of information, you can say, oh, I haven't accepted a point of information yet and it's three minutes fifty. I better get a point of information. And if no one's standing up, you can always say, um, and I'll take a point of information if anyone has one and then fluster someone into standing up and offering a fairly bad point of information. Um, okay, I think, like, that's... Oh, go, yeah. Perhaps a bit stupid question. Is there a person who shows you how much time you have in BP? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, I know in some debates people have, like, there are, yeah. you, there are a few so, judges that you'll get a bang time. after one minute and a bang after mm -hmm. four minutes. So, um, you, like, if you don't have a timepiece, that you basically measure yourself by that. You know, by the first bang, you should sort of have started your first point. Um, and substantive. Well, you then kind of, it's, it varies um, from speech to speech. Obviously, like, it, sometimes you just have to spend more time in rebuttal. Um, I spent like the first two and a half minutes in rebuttal, um, like sometimes longer, if necessary. Um, but as a general rule, like, when that first bang hits, you should kind of have started talking about your first point. By the fourth bang, uh, sorry, the fourth bang, the, the four minute bang, you should kind of be most of the way through your third point and then wrapping things up. Um, in a standard like three point structure speech, that's how you kind of go. But yeah, just sort of. I, I, I don't ever use the stuff much, to be honest. I kind of go by innate timekeeping. Yeah, I just, I also, I, I'm vaguely aware of the 60 seconds, like, I have 60 seconds at the start to, like, get momentum up, I have 60 seconds at the end to wrap things up and wind things down and end on the dot, and then I've got three minutes in the middle um, to talk about some sense of stuff. Um, 
However, I would advise, given you all have stopwatches, that it would probably make more sense for you guys to at least have it, like, if you feel you have an innate magical awareness, that's really cool, that's great. Um, however, it's better to accept a point of information and have, like, even if you're not looking at it, to have a timer going so that if you go, oh, I'm not sure where I am, you can look at it and you've got that option there. And then you can say, you know, make sure you do accept a point of information, make sure you do not run out of time. Like, it is a useful thing to do. Um, and it is something I would advise you trying to. I mean, it's true that some people are more comfortable not having any kind of timepiece, but I've always found it a lot easier to have some kind of awareness. Um, any more questions? Okay, well I think we probably just about have time to run a top after. So that means we need four volunteers that are willing to be a bit guinea pigs, um, and like, we're not going to be very critical, but it's going to be a learning experience for everyone and we'll give you really good feedback, so we'll actually give you an advantage tomorrow because you'll have had a great improvement experience um, and we'll give you some feedback and we'll look specifically at rebuttal and everyone else will get insight into what it is to be a judge and we'll talk about what we think went well, what we think, well not went badly, but what we think could do with constructive criticism. Um, so, are there four people that would mind me? But one, two. Is that a half hand up? No. no <laughs> Come on. Three. Three. Oh. And one more. This will be a nice and beneficial experience. Mm -hmm. No promise. <laughs> Four. Perfect. Um, you two seem like you're really good friends. Yeah. Well, I'm going to split you up then. Um, so you two. You two go together, and you two go together, because I think it's better to be, you know, make friends with new people as well. That's a great bonding experience. Um, so what we'll do is we'll give you about 15 minutes of preparation time. Um, I suggest you kind of go outside and prep a case. Um, Using all of the things you've done today. While you're around, we'll just chat with the people in there and answer questions and help. Okay, you and I are going to So okay. we okay. have 15 minutes of preparation. Do you have you worked out which ones are popular, which ones are? Oh, right. Prop. Okay. The motion we're going to do is this house would legalise performance enhancing drugs in sport. Are you okay with that? You understand what? No, I'm not okay. That's the whole point. Okay, so if you guys go outside, we'll call you back again. Uh, 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 in about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. So, so, mag wij even op papier stukken? Okay, so what I want you guys to all do while they're speaking in the debate is like pay attention, see if they're doing the things that we've talked about specifically in this in this session really well or really bad. Well, not really bad, I don't want anyone to be mean because they were very good and volunteered. But I if you can see stuff like look really carefully at the way that points have actually engaged with each other, like look for what they're doing well in terms of flagging engagement and letting you know when they're engaging. And we'll have a like talk at the end about the way that these specific issues clash and like who won the tussles when people actually engaged with each other and actually talked about other people's ideas and why they did well or why they didn't take down points. Um, and also in terms of points of information, like I'm hoping they're going to offer points of information during the four speeches we see. If they don't, that would be fairly disappointing as we've just run a fairly long session <coughs> of points of information. If they do, like take note of what you think like was the most effective point of information or which point of information works the best in the debate. It's like keep a track of that. And just generally like get used to kind of following the debate. Like the good the way we tend to judge BP is as James showed you. Like oh, oh that's not high quality paper. Um, 
like drawing on your pads a kind of cross that was fairly poorly drawn, following the kind of arguments, following where the engagement happened. Like getting used to judging debates will help you all debate because you'll see what works, you'll see what doesn't work, you'll see what's useful to a judge and not be spoke to a judge. Um, yeah. Any questions on that? <laughs> and also, as an anti-identity, um, I mean, I don't anticipate you'll do this, I think it's more likely you'll probably just end up chatting amongst yourselves, but while we're waiting for them, why don't you think of what you'd run on this debate, what you think are the good reasons for it, or the good reasons against it. Um, for legalizing performance and passing trial. Uh, the motion was this house would legalize performance of healthy health and drugs in sports. Just explaining two things. Why it's important, um, why it's relevant to the motion, what are the harms or benefits? Actually, this is way more than two things. I'm running it through and I've got another one as well. Um, it's like, why is it important? Why is it relevant to the motion? To the harms or benefits. It's like thinking about the different people, the different groups that might harm, the impacts of it. And then how does it achieve these harms or benefits? So with the um, with the examples of this house legalized prostitution, which we talked a lot about. Like, say our statement was, 
this empowers women, or um, this, this benefits prostitutes, would be like a good starting point, right? So our statement is, this benefits prostitutes. Why is this important? We think it's important because, you know, prostitutes, people too, they have the same rights as us, they, they have a right to, like, not get ill just because of their job, not to be harmed just because of their job. Um, what's the harms if we don't do this? If we do do this, we say the harms, to, the benefits, to, or not the benefits, the benefits of prostitutes are they have to be access to good health care, means of exchanges, it's regulated, they're not beat up by gyms. These are all benefits of doing this. These are ways in which it actually benefits women. Yeah. So then, yeah, but you say that it's going to be comparatively more. Actually, another thing to add in the appeal that in the explanation is comparative. So as well as why is it better than why is it better? Like comparatively, why is it better on your side than that? So just, I just put like a thing there and then say comparative because all of these things can be comparative. Um, so the crucial thing is how does it actually achieve these things? And that's where the real explanation and analysis actually comes in. I think that's what we spent a lot of time talking about today. But, um, so saying like the way that we get the benefits that we say, the way that like women are saying, <laughs> we have very specific causal mechanisms, we have, like, we're going to persuade people to use these prostitutes, and when we persuade people to use these prostitutes, not like everyone, right? yeah, it does sound like we're going to persuade them, if they're going to use prostitutes, we're going to encourage them to use these ones, um, and it's, like the way we're going to go about this is by making it seem generally more attractive as a situation. It's going to, it's like explaining the actual cause. Yeah, like the key thing is the cause of the narrative, which lots of people miss out, and that's how it actually So that's the competition. So I think you're going to be, it's really a competition. There's going to be winners here. Um, Oh really? Okay. So, okay. So what I think is going to happen tomorrow is you're going to be put into pairing. I think randomly. Um, so you're going to make a new friend, which is going to be fun. Um, we put you into random pairings. Then we're going to do four rounds where you're going to basically apply what you've learned today. There'll be four different debates, and then I think the top four teams will go through and have a big final public debate in front of everyone. <coughs> everyone does four of the debates. So oh, rounds one to four. Everyone. Will the top of the debate be in the B no? or? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, right. so there are two different things. There's the public debate and there's the final. The final is BT, the public debate is, I think, different. I don't know. Where can you choose your partner? You don't choose your partner. Where do you find them? Yeah. Oh, I think you'll find that out later tonight. I'm not entirely sure about that. We were just told you'd be posted. This is a top half debate. This doesn't really reflect a lot of the complexities and nuances that you get to the bottom half. But I think we can still see a bit about engagement and please offer points of information because we've been talking about that a lot. That would be nice. Um, 
Okay, so the motion before the house was this house would uh, is an equalise performance in answering drugs in sports. Um, I'd like to welcome the Prime Minister to take the case for the proposition. Um, we're going to discuss uh, the, legal, the legalization of performance in answering drugs in sports. Um, of course, um, you're right. Um, we're going to talk about two points about uh, how fair play will be enhanced and about the economic benefit, benefits of this motion. So, firstly, I would like to talk about fair play. Uh, if everybody uses it, if everybody uses performance enhancing drugs, everybody's performance will be at the same level again and sports are going to be more fair. Um, also, right now, a lot of people uh, don't watch sports anymore because uh, they lost faith in it. If performance enhancing drugs, the first one is Oh, yeah, it's still protected time. Um, um, continue. Um, if um, a lot of people don't watch uh, sports anymore because uh, they lost faith in uh, the, the sportsmanship of a lot of uh, athletes, so if we make performance enhancing drugs legalized, uh, um, um, <laughs> The audience of states in sports is going to be restored and there is going to be a, a new <coughs> revived sports feeling for the country. Uh, secondly, we're going to talk about the economic benefits. Um, how do you think that uh, people will enjoy watching athletes who fake that they have trained for something um, while they've actually just taken some pills and built some muscles? Um, well, just like now, a lot of athletes are taking drugs. So um, now, only now it's illegal. If we legalize drugs, uh, people will know the the drugs. You can't just be an athlete without training. So it's performance enhancing drugs, not drugs. Um, so people will have to restore it. So we're going to talk about economic benefits. Um, if you legalize um, performance enhance, enhancing drugs. Of course, you can ask uh, people to buy them to pay taxes, and with more taxes you have more money to spend, and uh, we could use this money to uh, enhance fair pay. Also, um, it will be a big benefit for big uh, medical companies because they make the drugs, and uh, that way we could create more jobs. If medical companies are bigger, they have more uh, places for people to work, and that way the economy will be better. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the speaker for his remarks and welcome the Leader of the Opposition to begin the case against the motion. Yes. Um, we're going to talk about three points. Um, the point that uh, when we use uh, drugs, you actually discourage the training to achieve a certain level of uh, in, in sports. Um, it actually becomes unfair. Uh, and not fair, um, and it would be uh, more about the drugs than about the experience. Um, you discourage training of uh, athletes. Uh, when uh, athletes uh, want to become good at sports, they train a lot. And uh, when you uh, give them drugs, they will uh, train less and focus more on drugs. It would be more uh, a competition about uh, uh, the drugs, who, who can get the best drugs, in, uh, instead of who, can, who trains the most, who uh, spends the most time on uh, new training methods and uh, accomplishing new uh, achievements in the field of sports. It becomes unfair because uh, how many drugs are you, are you allowed to take? Um, one pill, two pill, two pills. Um, so, once. Uh, right now, uh, from the top. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, athletes can train as much as they want. Uh, they do agnostics and work. But um, when um, I was talking about the. Uh, I was talking about that. Um, <laughs> 
I was talking about uh, taking drugs would be uh, unfair for the sports uh, community. Um, if, if someone can choose to take 10 pills uh, on a day and someone else takes one, uh, the one with the 10 pills is uh, in a great advantage. But he, does not do, uh, he doesn't do any uh, extra work for it. Uh, and in actual sports now, someone who trains 10 times as much invests 10 times uh, more time but he accomplishes more so, than the game. Yes. Why won't the uh, sportsman who takes only one pill, why won't he take nine more pills? Uh, because it's dangerous for your health. Um, but that's what my uh, other person talk about. <laughs> uh, and final, uh, when you take drugs, it would be more about uh, the drug instead of the experience. Uh, as you're an athlete, uh, athletes themselves uh, will feel better about uh, winning a game or becoming an Olympic champion when they've trained several years for it instead of uh, taking a couple of pills. For information. Yes. Uh, athletes right now use drugs to, to win and they still feel good when they win, so why would it change when uh, you Well, how do you know? Why would you um, Right now, um, not many athletes take drugs because uh, there are a lot of investigations, uh, and just like with the uh, uh, Neil Armstrong uh, incident, uh, if you use drugs right now, you get kicked out. And um, thank you, yeah. um, And actually, not that many athletes take drugs as you think they do. So. Uh, it would not be uh, about the experience, but about the drugs. Um, you said that uh, people would enjoy watching um, uh, sports, uh, <coughs> sportsmen play. Uh, you would say uh, watching, uh, for example, a game of football, watching players uh, on the field, <coughs> and when you um, when you know that they have taken uh, drugs that improve their um, uh, improve their speed when they're running, or uh, improve leg muscles so they can uh, jump higher, um, it isn't as much fun because well you see a couple of guys running on the field but they haven't trained for it. It's just about the pills they've taken, and that would um, also discourage uh, viewers to go to the games and uh, a lot of uh, income will be missed by um, the legalization of uh, drugs. I'd like to thank the speaker for his remarks and welcome the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the case for proposition. <laughs> For proposition. Um, I'll be talking in uh, three points. Uh, firstly, I'll talk about the fair play point, and I'll talk a bit about economics, and then I'll bring in our own third argument, which would be protecting poor sportsmen, basically. So, uh, on to the first argument, which was fair play. First, I'm going to do some rebutting, then I'll do some extensions. Now, to the rebutting, they said that um, it would be more about drugs and less about experience. Well, what we see is that, um, what's the mechanism that will happen if we legalize drugs? There will be sportsmen, who will be, all of them will be taking drugs, and since all of them very, very want to win, they fund the sponsors, they get the money, they take more drugs so that they can perform better. But, there comes a limit. We agree that uh, drugs are bad for health if you take too lots of them, obviously, but uh, starting from one point, you also have to train in order to be better than the other person who takes drugs. And we think that this is the crucial point. Because it will also mean that the sportsmen won't just be random people from the street who will be fed drugs, but they will also actually have to train and sports will still be about sports. <coughs> Moving on to the mechanism, um, we think that uh, if all of the sportsmen take drugs, it would be back to fair play because all of them would take uh, drugs the equal amount. For example, 90% of uh, cyclists actually use uh, steroids and right now we cannot see any crucial uh, crisis in the field of cycling. Instead, we still see the um, 
uh, performance and we still see the competition and we still see sports. And we think that that's the most important thing. We want to see better sports. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Um, you say that when every uh, athlete um, takes drugs, it, uh, and all the same amount, it will still be about sports, but, what it, uh, but it is bad for your health. So if athletes don't want to choose uh, to take drugs, uh, they will be in a disadvantage to other athletes who take the unhealthy drug to become better in, drug, uh, in uh, sports. No, um, what I said was that if you take too many drugs, it's bad for your health. We think that if you take a, a rational amount of drugs, it's not, that, it's not bad for you. And we think that that's where the training part comes in. So, I don't think that uh, this, um, a certain amount of drugs is bad for your health. Now, um, moving on to the second point on the fair play, which was uh, restoring the faith of the audience. The opposition said that people will not enjoy it as much if people jump higher. We think that's exactly what people will enjoy. You don't want to see them just, you know, running around doing these small jumps. You want to see them jump higher and higher and higher. And that is what will, what will bring crowds back to sports, because they will enjoy the performances more and more. We think that if we allow people to use drugs, they will actually perform better. And that's what we want to see in sports. Now, moving on to the economic point, which we didn't really tackle, I'm still going to talk about it because we believe that it still stands. Firstly, we can gain that taxes uh, from the uh, drugs that are being sold and we think that's very beneficial. For example, you can use the same uh, money for um, building better sports complexes and so on and so forth. And secondly, we think that we can still, um, uh, for example, tax the big companies that will uh, produce the drugs. And the companies itself will be very, very happy because they will have a small, uh, bigger field on which to uh, work on um, and they'll uh, uh, be able to develop a certain field more. Now, uh, to our own uh, constructive argument, uh, it, it, which was protecting sportsmen. Right now what we see is that there are lots of sportsmen who are actually really good, but that for some reason they decide to take uh, one pill and for that their, career, their entire career is ruined. We do not want to see that. We want to see sports for people who are actually happy and who are able to develop their career. We don't want uh, uh, to see how they uh, are ruined for some uh, bad choice. And even furthermore, if that choice is not actually bad for their health, and furthermore, if it actually uh, enables them, them to uh, perform better. So, what have we told you about today? Firstly, I told you about how drugs are actually not that bad for your health and how they uh, make, allow you to perform better. I told you about how training is still important in sports and how that is what we want to see. I told you about people who actually want to see uh, that the sports people so-called jump higher. I told you about we can get some economic benefits and I told you that we do not want to see sad sports people in the fields of sports today. Thank you. Speakers on her remarks and welcome the leader of the opposition to make a case against it. Distinctive speaker of the house. Um, our, the government came back with a few with a few arguments to our to our attacks. They say that it would be more fair or it would solve unfairness if all sportsmen would take an equal amount of drugs all sportsmen would be equally good or equally at hand. They won't, for a very simple reason. Some people will get more drugs for they have more money to buy it. Some people will get less drugs. Some people will say, I want to play this fair. And the government discourages, discourages fair play. Even worse, the government enhances unfair play. The government tells people that if you cheat, you win. And if you do not cheat, you lose. And this is not something what I think this government should, should do. The Olympic, the, watching the Olympic, and most of all listening to the, to the Prime Minister's speeches after the Olympic, encourage, encouraging young people to sport, making sports better, working for a healthier nation is not reached by this. We will, by making the gap grow between the professionals who use the drugs and the amateurs in the street will not encourage people to sport and will not contribute to a healthier and better country. How can you control furthermore, how can you control that everyone is taking the same amount of drugs? If you open the market and say it is legal, you can take as much as you want. By this you will get unfair play. But sir, 
Um, do you think that right now all of these sportsmen have equal uh, disabilities for training? I think that working hard is more equal than, than, than just encouraging your funders to buy you drugs and to buy you stuff where you can train with. Furthermore, restoring faith. Restoring faith. Very, very, very important, a very important topic, but totally missed by the government's plan. If you want to restore faith, you have to restore the romance. Not the possibility for everyone to be as good if they would have if you would have the possibility to get to the drugs, but which they won't. If you want to restore faith, you have to show that if you work hard, if you play fair, and if you and if you take the best out of yourself, not the best out of your funder's money, you will be the best sportsman ever. No, thank you. The economic argument. Is benefit more important than teaching our children how to play fair? I don't think so. We, we teach our children that they can't cheat a test at school, that they can't lie to us. Why should they be allowed or even encouraged to do so in sport? Yes? No, sir, if you legalize drugs, they won't cheat anymore because it's legalized. So why do you say they still cheat if they won't? I say that they will cheat for the same reason if, as if you would allow children to cheat at their tests. It won't be fair anymore. For you <coughs> encourage unfair play and you encourage people who should actually lose to win. It would be the same as saying that, yeah, football, you know, people want to see People want to see the ball go into the net. You know what? We say that you can pick up the ball. Okay. No, thank you. In conclusion, by, by doing this, the government does not restore faith, does not help fair play, and does not contribute to a healthier, healthier prison. Thank you. Okay, we'll be very quick, as obviously we don't want to be last to the queue for dinner. Um, <laughs> Quickly, did anyone have a POI they thought was especially good in that debate? No? We said, well, I did. I thought there were good, a few good POIs in that debate. <coughs> I thought the, the POI from this side about why can't they just take loads of pills um, was a good one. Equally, I thought the POI um, that Lead of the Opposition, so I don't know your name, offered about would people, it, you say drugs are unhealthy and you say that everyone's going to end up taking loads of drugs to compete with each other, doesn't that mean that everyone's going to end up really unhealthy? It was a really strong point of information. It was like it logically followed, it makes you concede something tactically, it was very good, especially given your partner was then talking about the health benefits. That was the example of a really good point of information. Quickly, finally, on engagement, like there were clear points where people actually engaged with each other in that debate. Like, I thought it was a problem that Leader of the Opposition didn't first engage with the economic points, and it was a strong tactical thing for Deputy Prime Minister to bring that up and say, look, that hasn't been engaged with. But then it did eventually get engaged with by Deputy Leader of the Opposition. So I thought that was really strong. There was engagement about fairness. There was a long back and forth about fairness, which makes it easier for us to judge. There was a long back and forth about economics, and there was... A bit, there was a long back and forth about audience perception of how successful or unsuccessful the sport was, or faith being restored or denied in sport. Like, that was a really good example. I hope you will take away the idea of like, where things are at the engaged. Um, I won't give like, long personal feedback to the speakers in front of everyone, because I don't think that's fair, because you, know, you volunteered. What I will say is I have feedback. I would encourage you to come and talk to me, and I'll tell you what things you did really well, what things could be improved for tomorrow. Um, otherwise, thank you all for what I hope was a useful session and good luck for the competition tomorrow.